Okay, so to conclude this week's topic, I'm going to look at the effects of inequality and begin start talking about violence. Um, so, you know, violence is really, in sociology and anthropology, been a really key thing to study for throughout uh, the existence of those disciplines. Um, and as I was saying earlier in the lecture, I think, you know, violent relations fundamentally underpin um, consumer uh, culture. Um, Slavoj Zizek, who's a very prominent um, kind of Marxist theorist, has become a bit of a kind of talking head clown, I would say, over the past yeah. couple of decades. And become increasingly difficult to understand. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. But um, has a couple of books that I think are particularly useful. Um, certainly The Sublime Object of Ideology is a great, a great book, but also he's a very short, sharp, and sometimes funny book on violence. Um, but he has become this kind of talking head now. Like he has an opinion on everything and like mm. it doesn't make sense anymore. Mm. So I'm talking about his written works here. Um, he, uh, in his book on violence, um, argues that much of the physical violence and suffering are supported by what he calls systemic violence, a hidden violence that is at the heart of economic imperatives and neoliberalism. So he makes a kind of real distinction here between what we understand as real violence, that physical stuff, um, how they're seen of kind of often as symptoms of something not working, mm. as kind of almost matter out of place. So like, mm. you know, if things are functioning smoothly, there'll be no violence, and mm. like it means that something's going wrong. Mm. Zizek kind of turns that on the head. He kind of argues that those violence, that those instances of violence, are actually, you know, key, uh, I suppose, effects mm. of these kind of unequal systems. Physical violence is then is kind of it's presented as kind of break from the normal peaceful state, but Really, systemic violence that underpins society can be understood as a key cause of this real violence. Hmm. It seems like a rational outburst when there's kind of riots or there's like people dying in factories, but really, this is the norm of the way that capitalism works. I think it relates quite well to when we're talking about infrastructure and infrastructural brutalism. Yep. And if you think about Solomon stuff about potholes, for example, it's like Car crashes, these, man. these so wounding, these, they're, they're built in yeah. to the system. They're, 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 they're expected yeah. breaches and outcomes. Yeah, it's yeah, not yeah. that it's not functioning properly. It's, this is yeah. how it functions. Yeah. It produces collateral and I think yeah. with Zizek it's, yeah, this is a sign of how things work, not how they don't work. Definitely, yeah, that's right. So, he, he wants to make a kind of distinction between subjective and objective violence. So, it's the subjective violence is the violence he kind of subjected to. It's that corporal emotional violence that um, you know was kind of seen as real violence. For him, the objective violence is his hidden, symbolic, systemic kind of nature of violence. It's part of cultures, politics, mm. traditions, economics. Um, and the, again, I won't read out that whole quote, but like, systemic violence is thus something like the notorious dark matter of physics, the counterpart to the all too visible subjective violence. It's kind of this kind of thing that we, we know that our systems do this. Mm. We kind of do understand it, but it's, we just kind of let it go and mm. don't talk about it too much. It's kind of, it, it, it's ideological, but even that's not a term that really captures mm. what's going on here. It's, um, um, it's, it's something else. So um, I think, again, if you're interested in thinking about violence and different versions of it and the way that our systems kind of support and, um, and kind of reproduce it, uh, Zizek's book called Violence is a, is a good place to have a look, look at. So, what's some examples of this? I think I've, we've used, I've mentioned this a few times in the mm. course already. You know, this kind of gore capitalism, necropolitic stuff, but like, you know, even this example I'm using here has kind of become well known mm. to the point where it's almost banal example mm. to use. Mm. But like, it's still. Yeah, hey, how about that capitalism, eh? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, the photo in there is like the Foxconn um, factories. Again, about not quite 10 years ago, it was. There's a bunch of workers in those factories that were committing suicide. Um, again, they don't change the work practices. They put up a net to try and stop people or catch people that are jumping off the building. Um, there's a major riot involved there. About 79,000 people work there. But, like, you know, we just kind of... Again, we, this, this horrible instance of, what's, of violence, of, like, people driven to the point of suicide, is just kind of an accepted part of mm. these relations we've been talking about. Um, you know, the phones in our pocket like are, are coming from these things. Another, again, we've used throughout the course, I think, is the Coltan Mining, and there's a great book on that. I've got that book here too. Um, this is from a series of books put out by um, 
polity that kind of talks about the actual material things. And they're all very depressing. Yeah, they are. The timber one <laughs> is the most depressing. Yeah, about you know, the, the kind of... gets thrown. And, yeah, the waste uh, in there. Yeah. Yeah. The human relations. So, like, again, the necropolitics of our digital devices, the coltan that's used to kind of make the capacitors that are so central to how, you know, the circuits and batteries in our phones work, are mined in these conditions that the, the photo expresses there, and often by young boys and often who have been human trafficked. Um, again, I won't go into the um, read out that whole thing there, um, but the, that resources series is, you know, I think an exceptional piece of public sociology that mm. um, really unpacks and brings the kind of backstage of, um, you know, the things we own mm. through the kind of um, ingredients that make it up, like timber, like water, mm. like air, mm. like Colton, like um, I think there's one on iron, maybe. Mm. I, can't I can't remember what they're all about. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. fish, oil, food, yeah. But what's interesting about this, and I was kind of flagged earlier on, that like, and maybe maybe the realization of this systemic violence, maybe the ironic spectatorship of of kind of this death and destruction and um, waste and um, that kind of thing, maybe it does have effects on our own happiness. Mm. Much of the kind of sociological research and even psychological research, when done properly, and when you know some economic measures around here, kind of show that people in the West comfortable people, middle class people, aren't happy. Um, there's, a, there's a new kind of field of happiness studies that's very interdisciplinary and there's controversies around whether you can even measure something like mm. happiness um, and whether it's a worthwhile endeavour to try and do. But it seems that many of the key indicators of happiness um, have kind of plateaued or dropped off in recent decades. And this is particularly a case in what we I would call the minority world, um, you know, the so-called West or the First mm. World. That's the minority of population. The majority world is those other symbolically violent categories of the Third World or the Developing World. So I think the, by calling us the minority world is a kind of nice piece of alter symbolic violence in a way. Um, what seems to be happening it relates to this kind of desire and satisfaction thing that I think Bauman touches upon. Um, as we have more and more stuff, it doesn't seem to be making us any happier. Michael Pusey's, I think, really influential and very um, good research, I think it was conducted mostly in the late 90s, published in the 2000s, um, around Middle Australia, a term, you know, coined by a sociologist that becomes kind of a plaything of mm. politics. Mm -hmm. as kind of like the battlers and that kind of thing that like sort of Howard and stuff were talking about. Found there's a real gap between the kind of rhetoric of neoliberalism and consumerism and then the way that people are actually talking about their day-to-day -day lives when he was t um, interviewing them. High levels of, um, you know, pressure to kind of status symbols and right car and go to the send your kids to the right school mm. and live in the right place, um, combined with the increasingly precarious labour market, seem to be kind of increasing notions of unhappiness, dissatisfaction, stress, uncertainty, insecurity, fear, and meaninglessness. Mm. So, are we happy? Maybe not. Um, the work in, in the Australian Institute, Clive Hamilton, when he was part of that, and, and Richard Dennis, who's kind of still the kind of honcho of the Australian Institute, have argued that, that we experience what he calls growth fetish and affluenza. Affluenza is the idea that like affluence doesn't really um, make us happy; it makes us sick, hmm. um, which is a kind of nice little neologism, I think. So here, rampant consumerism is the cause of our unhappiness, not the, the problems. And again, I think it, this does relate to that kind of desire and satisfaction thing that like you know you may get some happiness when you get the new phone and you mm. get some kind of instant gratification but then it passes and really you still have the, all the problems in your life to deal with so for this kind of perspective um, we aspire to lifestyle beyond our means and again this is interesting in terms of aspiration yeah. in e economics someone on a hundred grand a year is then jealous of the person on two hundred grand a yeah. year who then is jealous of the person on a million a year who's, you know someone with a nice house in Cooks Hill is jealous of the person that has the mansion on Merriweather Beach. Yeah. Um, satisfaction here is never the object, it's always something more. The millionaire is jealous of the billionaire kind yeah. of thing. So we're spending ourselves sick, we're kind of wasteful, we're overworked, we're stressed. And what these um, work often shows too is then we end up kind of doing a bunch of stuff to try and address this that seems to not fix it but make it worse. So we like go to the gym and we take these kind of drugs and we get involved in wellness stuff and all these kind of right. things to try and be more productive and it's just this kind of hamster wheel of kind of unhappiness. So, 
um, you know, again, the Australian Institute, these figures are a little bit dated now, but, um, you know, have some kind of interesting research on this. I won't go into it. You can read it yourself. But, like, you know, millionaires say they're, like, they're not comfortable. Mm. Um, you know, the, um, or say that they're um, just getting along. Um, you know, 5% of millionaires see themselves as prosperous. 50% say that they're reasonably comfortable. 47% of the highest income, um, is it quantile, the top 20%, say they can't buy everything that they need, um, which is, you know, again, relates well, back, to, <laughs> back to things like where the way that we define things like needs and wants, yeah. you know, and as you maybe have more money, things that probably are wants become needs because we're kind of in this kind of status system. It probably also shows you how relative people's comparisons are. And yeah. small in lots of ways, you know. Yeah. I often think about who are the people that people are comparing themselves to all of the time. And even in, in terms of trying to make big decisions, you know, where, where is the, where is the mm. feedback coming from, from from other people, even in the realm of politics? You know, it's not as if people are worried about every single person in Australia will think, well, think about what that minister they always had a rivalry will think, or that person who's always supported them will think, etc., etc., etc. It's often quite a vacuum in which people make these comparisons and have these feelings of yeah. inadequacy or adequacy. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So I think to sum up this is like, again, this, this kind of relates to much critical theory in the sense that like, you know, the kind of pseudo individualism of consumerism doesn't seem to provide us with much happiness. But again, I would move away from that kind of cultural dupe yeah. analysis of what people, you know, I'm, I'm much more kind of, I suppose, um, empathetic to the Miller point of view here that things create meaning mm. and relations and have all these kind of things that are important to us. I suppose when the things become more fetishized as expressions of ourselves, yeah. as our worth and our value and our status. And when people invest in that aspect of it more, that's when it becomes more problematic. So there's a kind of um, playoff here between the way that, you know, your stuff, the way, you know, you exchange experiences and emotions and stuff like that with people around you through those things is one aspect of this. The other is the way that that therefore can sometimes be more pernicious, mm. things like, you know, status anxiety and stuff like that. There's a, a tension that goes on here that kind of relates to the possibility of being satisfied and happy and that kind of stuff. You know, there's much um, philosophy for centuries about, you know, the very possibility or impossibility of humans ever being happy. Mm -hmm. But, like, I suppose more to kind of the mundane day-to-day -day thing in terms of what seems to be well um, now understood increased rates of things like mental health stuff around anxiety and depression. Um, you know, some are increasingly making connections between, you know, these alienating aspects of consumer culture and capitalism mm -hmm to that kind of stuff. Others are kind of talking about the medical industrial complex as mm -hmm. well and the way those things may be overprescribed. But, um, you know, again, you can see, as we have been throughout the course, mm. um, kind of sitting on the fence a bit with this kind of stuff. It's a bit of one and the other, but yeah. like, um, you know, we all get happiness somewhat from the things that we use and we all uh, maybe are kind of owned by them as well. And I think debt is so crucial in all of this. And I think even people who, who say may earn well or or have capacity to have a lot, still fear that it could disappear quickly. Yeah. And, in, and the indebtedness means that, that they won't yep. be able to continue and that there's this thing hanging over them, I can't lose my job because I'm so indebted. Yep. Mortgage, um, right. repayments, lifestyle, etc. Yeah. And I think that the, the availability back to some one of the early concepts we looked at of, of, of cheap finance, cheap money, mm. Mm. fuels a lot of this, fuels yep. a lot of this desire and aspiration and then increases the anxiety that if yep. you wake up tomorrow, it could all be gone if there's a restructuring decision and you're gone and you're yep. gone, etc. So the never feeling comfortable is also I think part of the fact that we we, we set up a life on a bubble. And when that bubble bursts mm. we are so worried it's gonna get taken away. Yeah. And I think that hits lots of different levels of the society in ways that it might not have yeah. before. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. And I, and my research group is doing a bunch of research around young people and their experiences of debt. So um, hopefully we'll be able to publish some of that stuff soon. Okay, so we thought at this last lecture we would um, just very quickly do a quick course conclusion. Very quickly. Very quickly. <laughs> so, um, you know, I've kind of been the consumption guy. Um, Duncan's been the technology guy, although we've kind of, you know, discussed both throughout. I suppose in terms of consumption, it's definitely a way of life. M many of mm -hmm. the things that we do in the world now are kind of done through and with these consumer products. Mm -hmm. They are definitely the way that we relate to each other, the way we think about ourselves. Um, much of the technology that's developed mm -hmm. over the past couple of decades in particular is central to consumer processes. It accentuates this, it manipulates 
aspects of it. It collects data of us. It tries to sell us stuff, all those kind of things. I think, you know, when something like sociology says we're moved from a production society to a consumption society and we talk about the cultural turn in the 60s, it's relevant in some ways, but we've also looked at as many, you know, how, yeah. how important production is yeah. and, and that kind of Someone's thing. Someone's still producing stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Some so societies are arranged I think that's it. as much an expression, again, of the kind of minority world's kind yeah. of almost free-floating consumption and not having to deal with the pointy end of production very much. Yeah. But I would say that, like, consumer culture, consumer capitalism, if you want to call it that, still, you know, is profoundly affected and reproduces all those social... Mm. contours of inequality that sociology has been so interested in kind of highlighting. So something like gentrification, for instance, is kind of can illustrate how consumer practices, geography, mobility, labour markets, policies, you know, advantage some people over mm. others. Um, and it's they're not just kind of free of, you know, class, race, gender, um, geography, all these kind of things. Importantly, towards the end of the course, we're kind of trying to highlight how our current rates of consumption are completely unsustainable. Not just the waste, but the way that kind of, you know, I think the way that we live in Australia needs like, what is it now, 3.2 mm. Earths to actually mm -hmm. sustain it, and obviously that's not going to happen. So um, much of the, I think, important politics in the future is going to be around those problems. It mm. has been addressed, like, for a while, but, you know, nothing seems to be happening mm. so much. Um, you know, we can see the, all around the world the rise of the School for Climate Change, stuff like that. It's definitely becoming more of a mainstream social issue. The question now is is whether like we start addressing these things in time. Hmm. I think that, as we've mentioned, technology is changing how we consume, where and what we consume, but we can never overlook the actual humans that are all part of that, yep. both part of how things move around the world, how they get made, um, but, but also increasingly the way in which humans are part of those machines and processes, part of those technology loops. We talked about AI and the way it utilizes data and algorithms to shape what we consume um, and how what we consume feeds mm. big and small data and how that in itself is a massive economy where yeah. lots of fortunes are made um, and lots of yeah. value is created and lots of rights are, are, are trampled upon in, in the process. Yeah. And I think that's been such a dramatic change. We always hear about hey, how AI will transform work, the future, everything. But I think we've got to be quite critical and always use a sociological lens to understand mm. AI in that way. We've talked about infrastructure and how crucial that is as a focal point for thinking about the ways connectivity works, the ways it stalls, the harms and the benefits. So back to, to necropolitics and gore capitalism and the way in which infrastructure is an enabler and a mover of things that people want. It does have benefits, but that it also has lots of harms um, and that it also, we're quite vulnerable to its, its functioning and its ease. Mm. Um, We've talked about the production and consumption of crap and how this reflects low-end globalisation, but then also how it's met with a fetish for designed goods, made and crafted goods. That feeds into what we've talked about with gentrification, um, what we've talked about with sort of like hipster and image creation, sophisticated yep. consumption, etc., and how that spreads to different groups in the society and it's pushed um, by, by different manufacturers and consumers. Um, and we've talked about how local cultures of consumption slip into the global through connected networks and vice versa. And so then we've tried to have this balance between we can look at things at, at trends happening at a large scale, but then also analyze them closely and at a finer grain in particular contexts around particular objects, particular commodities, particular technologies. And I think what we, we want to leave people with is that idea that we're kind of constantly wanting to, to dip from, from global to sort of national, local, and mm. back up again and back into the middle in the way we analyze to get a much, much bigger picture. Yeah. Um, otherwise, we're stuck with, with fairly kind of that methodological nationalism yeah. um, or a kind of worse, vague-ish methodological globalism that doesn't give us enough detail, not enough ethnographic texture yeah. um, to, to really understand how change, consumption, uh, technology, and everyday life really works for people. Yeah. Okay. Hope you've enjoyed the course. We'll leave it at that. Yeah. <laughs>